thank you so much, uh, Rick and Susan and everyone for organizing this. This is an incredible day and it's such an important topic. So I'll go right into it. I have a lot of conflicts. They're listed there. So our, our group has been very focused on um, the development of synthetic DNA, uh, particularly for rapid emerging infectious diseases as well as cancers. And um, normally this is the curve that one sees with an outbreak and, and the response, it comes up and sort of by the time we finally get to it, it's, it's gone. Uh, However, COVID-19, as we've been discussing today, is obviously different. This is from just a few days ago, and um, we're up to over a million infections, 54,000 deaths, and 245,000 cases in the U.S. and 6,000 deaths. So uh, just a few weeks ago, um, everyone's pointed out how quick this has been, um, a report, uh, the British report to the WHO, on behalf of Imperial College, Neil uh, Ferguson and Leyden's paper sort of changed U.S. thinking on really where this outbreak was going to go. Um, and there were several important things in this report uh, that the um, White House responded to. That is, um, the inf effectiveness of any one in intervention was likely to be limited. Um, and basically, we have two current strategies, mitigation and suppression, which we're all living through in different ways as each state comes up with a way to implement these. Um, and then while we might slow the curve uh, and decrease health care demand, it will not ultimately make it go away. And, and finally, in their opening um, summary, uh, until we have a vaccine, really, this is not going to go away. I do want to point out there's a caveat that was not considered, and they state that right in there. They did not model in the impact of therapeutics. And this uh, report did um, have concerns about uh, morbidity, large numbers, and mortality in British and U.S. populations. So these are some of the outbreaks we've previously developed countermeasures for and published on, and uh, so each in turn of its own outbreak, Ebola, Zika, MERS, and now um, we're talking about COVID, and it's all based on synthetic DNA. We've focused on the ID route in particular for infectious disease, high concentrated formulation, simple to deliver, well-tolerated, consistent delivery, and temperature stable, and, and more dose sparing than I am, and we have a couple of papers reporting that now. So these are some of the timelines of those vaccines and their development. Um, Ebola took us about 17 months to get into the clinic. That vaccine's now in additional studies. That's the report of the first clinical trial. MERS, um, our first trial took about 10 months. These are the response rates that was published last year in Lancet ID. That's now been in expanded uh, studies in Asia. And Zika was 6.5 months. Um, and of course, uh, Pablo's uh, paper was one of the top 10 clinical achievements of 2018 for the speed and immunogenicity of that vaccine. So I'm going to focus on um, the coronaviruses. And so this is our MERS program. And uh, MERS, um, this is a team uh, led by Inovio that was funded eventually by CEPI. Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and there's many other collaborators um, at uh, ACK and at NIAID, uh, at um, Rocky Mountain Labs, for example. And so basically, the, we don't need the virus. It's designed off a sequence uh, from the different um, strains that are available, sequencing, uh, sequences optimized and designed. We focused on the spike antigen, and the model is shown here from MERS. We've heard a lot about that today. It was molecularly characterized, expressed in cells, and delivered by a skin um, dosing originally. And then we also did several macaque studies, and I think these are important based on some of the things that were discussed today and Stanley Perlman's talk 
focused on uh, some of the enhancement concerns. So in the first challenge study, which is shown here, the controls four of four exhibited severe disease while the vaccinated um, really exhibited um, no disease. And, and uh, this is an insulation model. So um, you can have very low viral loads, but you're installing the virus it directly into multiple sites. And, uh, and so it's very difficult to get to a zero in that assay. We've done subsequent studies which have confirmed the same thing, lower doses, um, one dose, and that is particularly important because we wanted to sort of see if there was any enhancement. There's not, there's always protection or disease attenuation. So based on that, um, the team uh, moved forward uh, this vaccine to the, the clinic. Um, the program was led by Kayvon Moore-Didijad from Walter Reed. These are the antibody responses developing over time out to week 60. This is comparison with um, antibodies developed in uh, convalescent patients. As you can see, they overlap. And also, this is longevity of the responses, uh, which was an area that um, Stanley brought up earlier. Importantly, here's the paper itself. This We also studied the T-cell responses, both uh, by Ellisbot and Flow, and there were very robust uh, CD4 and CD8 responses in this. This is T-cell responses in the convalescent patients from the Korean MERS outbreak. You can see we had a uh, potent response in all dose groups, and this is a summary at the end, including epitope uh, pool mapping showing the overall response of the vaccine is higher than the convalescent patients. So this background led to us receiving funding from, from the organization known as CEPI, which is a collaboration between Bill and Melinda Gates and the Wellcome Trust for funding, and then several governments, including um, Norway and Japan, which ha Norway houses CEPI. Um, and STEPI's goal is to develop countermeasures for emerging infectious diseases, uh, vaccines is their focus. Um, and based on that, uh, we were following this outbreak back in December, and the team was contacted. This is Joseph Kim, CEO of Inovio, uh, standing there um, receiving um, the original grant from CEPI. Uh, with Richard Hatchett, here's the head of CEPI. And um, there was discussion about whether we were going, well, whether we were following the outbreak, and we said we were. And uh, by the time they published the sequences, we had been started working on vaccine. And within a week of that, Richard Hatchett announced at Davos that they were going to fund three programs to develop a vaccine against the novel coronavirus. And the teams they funded were a GSK, University of Queensland team, uh, Anovio, and Wistar team, and Moderna and NIH. Since that time, they've added uh, about another five or six teams. So our approach was based on, again, this immune response, the CTLs, neutralizing antibodies, et cetera, development of MERS. And Dan Culp uh, at the Wistar who's a structural vaccinologist, really was uh, pivotal in helping us with our designs. Me Patel and Kar Mutumani were leaders in uh, part of the VIC, all part of the VIC, to um, develop program. But of course, uh, the team is led by Inovio and Kate Broderick, who's the head of research, and uh, Laurent Humeau, who's CSO, oversaw the direction of all the pro parts of the program. So we created the constructs. Uh, they were studied. Um, they were expressed at high levels. And then we moved into multiple different animal studies, developed multiple um, assays. This is um, T cells. T cells are induced as rapidly as seven days. Antibody titers are induced quite rapidly, even with a microgram dose. In mice and guinea pigs, the same outcome and endpoint titer are shown here after a single dose. These are all single dose studies here shown is 90 human primates, one or two milligram doses. T cells, there's cross reactivity, particularly to um, SARS CoV, but much less cross reactivity of T cells to MERS. 
and binding titers to both the S1, S2, as well as RBD um, were um, also described. In addition, functional assays were developed, a competition assay with the ACE, uh, ACE2, soluble ACE2 was developed and the vaccine was able to block that binding. And this is in mice and this, uh, this is from Dan's group. This is from Anovios showing uh, the same activity in um, guinea pigs. And in addition, uh, T cell epitopes were mapped uh, uh, by matrix assay and now are being studied uh, in fine mapping, and you can see there are multiple domains that come up in this kind of response in this particular haplotype of mice, and uh, we have this in more than one haplotype. So, um, of course, the safety package and the rest of the tox package and the production was all done through Inovio and contract uh, groups, and um, the IND was. Uh, submitted and basically, of course, the trials uh, were designed uh, with Pablo Tebas, who's been our longtime um, collaborator on these emerging infectious disease. Here he is in his outfit. And um, CEPI has funded this initial part of the program. There will be 40 patients treated, um, 20 at U, part at UPenn and part in Kansas City, Dr. Urban's group it's be safety and immunity. And then um, the plans are to move through that study and then on to a phase 2B um, um, study in focusing particularly on healthcare and first responders and high risk individuals. So um, Inovio has continued to build the team as shown here. The team now has multiple groups including the Department of Defense has joined, Ology has joined for large scale, larger scale production, VJXI for smaller scale, funded by now in addition the Bill among the Gates as well as the Department of Defense. And um, it's really the vision of Bill Gates to create CEPI that funded our initial program for MERS and also an Anovia program for LASA um, that is in this uh, New England Journal discussion. So uh, thank you very much for allowing us to present. There's many, many people that contributed to, I've particularly focused on COVID-2 in the um, acknowledgements here. And um, and uh, we're, we're um, happy to present. So thank you again for the opportunity.